Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're just going to give folks just a moment to join us and we will get started very shortly. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to the second webinar in the HIV and aging series. Uh, it looks like folks have already been introducing themselves in the chat. Please go ahead if you are willing to put your name and organization in the chat. And we'll get started in just one minute. Hey, we have uh, almost 200 folks and everyone is introducing themselves in the chat. Thank you so much. We will go ahead and get started. Next slide, please. Before we get started, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. First, this session is being recorded. After the webinar, the recording and corresponding materials will be available on the HUD Exchange. We will put this link in the chat. And due to the large volume of participants, everyone will be muted throughout the webinar. Please submit any questions that you have in the Q&A box, uh, which can be found in the bottom of your screen. It says Q&A and has those two little um, thought bubbles right there. Please just click on that and you can put your question in. And we will be monitoring those questions throughout the webinar. If you have thoughts or comments on the material, please feel free to use the chat feature you are already using and put it in the chat there. Uh, we will also be monitoring the chat throughout today's webinar. Next slide, please. My name is Ashley Kerr and I am representing the Technical Assistance Collaborative today. We are a HOPWA TA provider. Um, I'm joined by Kate Bridell, who is with the Office of HIV AIDS Housing and Health at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. I'm also joined by Crystal Pope of the Technical Assistance Collaborative and um, our special guest speaker, Joe Robinson, who will introduce himself later on today with the Silver Lining Project in Atlanta, Georgia. Next slide, please. So actually, um, I get to launch the first poll. So Ari, if you will please launch the poll, we have four questions that we would like to ask you. The first one being, who is here today? Are you a grantee, a project sponsor, HUD staff, or someone else? Do you have a sense of the number of people living with HIV who are over the age of 50 in the community that you serve? How familiar are you with the resources in your community that serve older adults and elders? 
And then the fourth question is, does your agency partner with any agencies that primarily serve older adults, such as your local area agency on aging? If we can take just a couple of moments to answer those questions, uh, that would be super helpful for us to know who's in the audience today. Okay, Ari, could we launch the results of the poll? All right, it looks like we have uh, a number of folks, including other, I guess we should have put a, uh, if you want to put in the chat uh, who you are or who you represent, that would be terrific. But that yes, you all do know that there are a number of folks uh, who are uh, 50 plus in your community that are living with HIV, that you are pretty familiar with the resources in your community, um, and that you are partnering with other community resources that specifically target uh, serving people who are uh, older adults in our community. So that's terrific. We're gonna really hope that you can add some of that to the chat today and please next slide. So let's go over the agenda. We are gonna talk again about the 3R vision and really why we have this series around HIV and aging. We are gonna have the presentation specifically on social uh, combating social isolation and loneliness. We are going to hear from the Silver Lining Project, and then we will answer any Q&A or Q uh, that comes in through the webinar, and we will do that as quickly as we can at the end of today's presentation. With that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Kate Burdell, who is going to start with 3R. Kate? Thanks, Ashley. You think after three years of this, I would uh, know how to unmute myself very quickly. Anyway, hello, everyone. Um, as many of you know, um, next slide, please. Our Reset, Renew, Recharge initiative is intended to help communities achieve program excellence and community uh, positive community impact, ensure that programs are designed to meet the changing needs of the modern HIV epidemic, promote equity for all people with HIV, and to underscore the importance of client-centered housing um, client-centered low barrier housing and services. The past few years have brought many challenges for our HOPWA grantees, project sponsors, and the thousands of low-income households impacted by HIV throughout the country. And the global COVID-19 pandemic stopped us in our tracks for many months and still impacts us today. That other virus caused us to rethink everything about the way we interact, the way we work, and even the places we live. So, now that the uh, public health emergency will be declared gone as in a week, uh, what better time to reset? Uh, the 3R strategy is a chance to restart HOPL modernization work. The five-year phase-in period, as you know, is over. And so we need to begin to reset our planning based on the newest budget projections, local HIV data, um, and things like this impact of aging. Modernization was a key focus for us for many years before the pandemic. And it's time to restart and reset some of our attention to that important planning and implementation. In light of that, it's also a great time to renew, to refresh the way that our programs operate by focusing on ways to adapt program activities based on lessons learned over the past few years. And finally, it's time to recharge. This looks like grantee and project sponsor capacity building, managing transition and program changes in a post-COVID time, rolling out trainings, resources and resource updates, and guidance that incorporates basic program knowledge, specialized program operations, financial management, improved coordination between health and housing, and even new ideas like incorporating status neutral housing and other approaches. Next slide, please. We established a vision for this work that embraces the importance of a sound HOPLA program, an equitable HOPLA program, and a needs-based HOPLA program. Beyond having a vision, the work of the 3R initiative will move us toward outcomes that will make a difference in the lives of people assisted by this program. This includes things like HOPLA communities intentionally integrating people with lived experience in all aspects of the work in a meaningful way. And that HOPLA communities will embrace an expanded vision for the HOPLA program one that shows understanding of the intents of the program and its connection to health outcomes and ending the HIV epidemic. 
So big picture, we anticipate that Hopwell communities will collaboratively define, design and implement Hopwell programs that follow the regulations, and understand the flexibilities, while also providing permanent housing and services in an equitable fashion, and will be able to accurately report on these efforts. Next slide, please. This HIV and aging webinar series is intended uh, to fit in with the 3R work, and it's intended to provide information to Hopwell grantees, project sponsors, interested field office staff, and the general public about resources that may be of benefit to older adults living with HIV in their communities. It's projected that by 2030, 70% of people with HIV in the US will be aged 50 or older. And looking at data across all HOPWA programs, we know that 46% of HOPWA eligible individuals served in the last fiscal year were aged 51 or older. HOPWA grantees and project sponsors need to be working to address the emerging needs of aging clients. And this particular webinar, as you heard, is focused on social isolation and loneliness, two things that the US Surgeon General recently referred to as one of our generation's greatest challenges. Next slide, please. People with HIV now have increasingly longer lifespans, and this is a testament to the effectiveness of antiretroviral therapy, because people with HIV who are diagnosed early, who get on and stay on ARTs, can keep the virus suppressed and live long and healthy lives. As people get older, many start to develop age-related programs impacting their mental, physical, and emotional well-being. For people with HIV in particular, studies show that HIV prematurely ages the body. Age-related issues may make it more difficult to get around at home, participate in community, or go to work. And this premature aging can cause symptoms we associate with the elderly to occur in people with HIV at a much earlier age. HIV and its treatment can also have effects on the brain. Researchers estimate that between 25 and 50% of people with HIV have HIV-associated neurocognitive disorder a spectrum of cognitive, motor, and or mood disorders characterized into three levels, asymptomatic, mild, and HIV-associated dementia. HIV-associated non-AIDS conditions occur frequently in older people with HIV, such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, renal disease, and cancer. And these conditions are likely related to a number of interacting factors, including chronic inflammation caused by HIV. Next slide, please. Some early HIV treatment regimens caused life-altering side effects, including lipodystrophy, which is fat accumulation or wasting, which can change the person's appearance, especially in their face. Uh, peripheral neuropathy happens when the nerves between the feet and less commonly the hands and the spinal cord become damaged. And as a result, peripheral neuropathy can cause feelings of numbness, tingling, burning, itching, or shooting pain. Treatment fatigue, emotional or physical weariness with taking HIV drugs may lead many long-term survivors to have difficulties adhering to their HIV regimen, which can eventually cause drug resistance. And however, uh, multi-drug resistant HIV is already a reality for a number of long-term survivors for whom effective treatment options are difficult to find. And inflammation, it's the body's response um, to a threat or damage. And because the immune system of a person living with HIV is always struggling to get rid of the virus, it is always activated or turned on. Um, and this is known as chronic low-level immune activation, which is a form of inflammation. Some research suggests that the body's response to complex trauma may also increase levels of inflammation. And ongoing inflammation appears to be related to many conditions, including heart disease and cancers. Next slide, please. Many long-term survivors have experienced tremendous loss, which is often exacerbated by stigma and discrimination. Older adults generally have smaller social networks, which can lead to social isolation and loneliness. Social isolation has been described as living without companionship, social support, or social connectedness. It has been linked to decreased quality of life, poor health status, increased healthcare utilization, functional decline, increased vulnerability to stress and death. Loneliness is also associated with poor health outcomes. Steve Cole, the director of the Social Gen Genomics Core Laboratory at the University of California, Los Angeles, has referred to the effects of loneliness like a fertilizer for other diseases. 
In fact, loneliness has, um, has been found to be more dangerous than smoking 15 cigarettes a day, uh, according to research done by the National Institute on Aging. Some factors that may contribute to social isolation and loneliness are retirement, reduced mobility, loss of transportation, financial challenges, and a loss of friends or significant others. Next slide, please. This loss of friends and significant others may sometimes lead to something called survivor's guilt. This is common among survivors of national, natural disasters, violent conflicts, and epidemics like this one. It refers to the feeling that many survivors have that they have done something wrong in surviving a traumatic event when others did not survive. AIDS survivor syndrome, a term that describes the psychological results of living through the most brutal years of the HIV pandemic, um, is associated with survivor's guilt. And it's also may have other symptoms such as depression, uncertainty about the future, suicidality, feelings of panic from growing older, social isolation and social withdrawal and more. And so these are things that we need to consider how we might be able to assist our clients when in addressing these challenges. To learn more about that, I'm gonna turn that over to my colleague, Crystal Pope. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, so to, to sort of move us into what can we do through the HAPA program, as well as in partnership with other community partners um, to address this emerging um, a, a need among people who are aging with HIV. Um, HAPA grantees and project sponsors do have some potential resources that can help support a, uh, aging clients. HAPA funding can be used for some activities. So we'll look at those um, a little bit closer. Um, and they include um, community-wide needs assessments, uh, use of resource ID, partner development, uh, case management methods, peer support, and a variety of housing options. Uh, next slide, please. So starting with the needs assessment, um, what's, what's shown on the slide here is the kinds of things that, that we generally like to ask on those needs assessment or the type of information that should be gathered. Uh, we're trying to um, make sure that programs are addressing the most critical current needs uh, of the client population, as well as looking to the future, especially when we're talking about aging of things that are anticipated um, for the future. But what is the most pressing? Um, and um, also generally speaking about um, whether our program is increasing hop or, or housing stability and access to care, and ultimately to decide whether our programs and strategy need to change as clients age or as other things um, uh, you know, may change within the community. So a key source of information about housing and service needs is this kind of needs assessment that investigates local circumstances, the needs and desires as well of HAPA eligible households Community-wide needs assessments are often utilized by grantees to set priorities for HAPA funding overall. In the context of HIV and aging, it's important to include a specific focus on the circumstances of aging clients in an overall needs assessment, or alternatively to conduct some needs assessment activities that are specific to aging, but are perhaps smaller in scale. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, this is our next poll. We'd like to hear from all of you, whether your organization or your community has conducted a needs assessment focused on or mm, including a component about aging clients.
So we're showing 41% <clears throat> of participants today um, have had that kind of needs assessment um, and others know it is. Um, so this is just, uh, that's interesting that that many have. And I think that for probably most programs, you know, people are aware that our client population is aging and that may mean some changes are needed uh, in the program activities that that are provided, but um, you know this is this series of webinars is an effort on HUD's part to bring that to the forefront as a as an emerging issue. So thank you very much for that. Uh, next, please. So a needs assessment really is something that that leads to the kind of program evolution that the three R strategy talks about um, being able to including lifting up voices of people with lived experience by asking and often compensating aging clients in this case to participate in program planning and implementation efforts um, having that kind of participation is useful it is good for clients but it's it's excellent for programs to really listen to um, how things are going how they should go what the concerns are and so forth and of course uh, as part of 3r also as kate talked about is expanding hopa budgets to cover new programs that uh, in this case focus on the housing and service needs of aging clients and um, uh, creating opportunities for people to engage in peer support and other social activities that can uh, combat isolation. Next, please. So community partners, I know all of you have your um, partners within communities and that changes over time as new programs emerge or new needs emerge. And I think a lot of the resources that are out there for people who are aging are not necessarily on everybody's radar and you may or may not know all of those, um, all of those agencies or organizations that are out there that could be good and effective partners. Um, uh, obviously, and in the forefront is Ryan White, grantees who can um, and do provide many um, coordinated services uh, with HAPA to benefit HAPA eligible households. Area agencies on aging um, are major national and local resource um, that coordinates and offers services to help older adults, especially to help them um, stay in their own homes. AARP, LGBTQ um, plus centers have uh, groups and peer support for older adults. Community centers often offer no or low cost um, services, including exercise classes and, and other types of programs as do uh, local colleges and, and universities. Um, the uh, next slide, please. wanted to actually call out um, a great resource that was mentioned in the first uh, HIV and aging webinar um, that is called the uh, the elder care locator, which is a public service of the US administration on aging to connect people with services for older adults and their families. And I um, will put the, the this link in the chat too. I would really encourage everybody to use this as a starting point. And um, if you go to the next slide, I did this as a, I entered um, Springfield, Illinois, for example, um, to see what resources they had. And um, this is one sample result out of probably 12 or 14 that came up. So there are lots of different kinds of organizations that do things in, in different areas and with a different focus, including 
things like transportation, legal assistance, nutrition services, both congregate and home delivered meals, um, organizations that do health screening and medication management, pharmaceutical assistance programs, health insurance counseling, uh, family caregiver support services and um, ombudsman and advocacy services, as well as uh, elder employment programs. And while some of those things can be delivered using HAPA funding, it's also good to know what else is in the community um, and what kind of partnerships could be brokered uh, so that HAPA funds could be used more towards housing or, or whatever the other uncovered needs might be. Uh, next, please. And clearly there are also um, medical, medically related partners that um, most uh, of you are familiar with, including working with local HIV clinics, the Ryan White grantees, um, and even gerontologists, because this, you know, we know a lot about HIV, but we we all as a group do not necessarily, are not necessarily um, experts in aging and in how to, uh, the best methods for approaching people and helping with um, not only medically related things, but um, social isolation um, and the depression that, that can result from that. Um, I would like to also ask the audience, all of you, if there are any other community or medical partners that haven't been mentioned that you used, if, if you can think of others, um, if you would put them in the chat, um, we'd like to see who else you're working with or have thought about working with. Okay, we have none at the moment, but we're going to just um, let, uh, keep that as an open question. Dental clinics, okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, so there are lots of things popping up right now, legal and financial benefits, service providers, um, you know, local consortiums of different kinds, senior and disability, um, organizations and I'm I'm glad someone put that in there because when um, you know one of the problems is is trying to be sure that you're referring people to uh, senior serving organizations who are eligible for their services because in some cases that means people who are 50 and above sometimes it means 60 and above sometimes it means Medicare age um, 65 and above. But many of those organizations also have a focus on disability, which would, um, in many cases, make um, HAPA eligible households eligible, um, even if they don't meet a certain age threshold. So thank you. We will put all of those together as a follow up to this um, so that we have a full list. And at this point, I am going to turn the presentation uh, back to Ashley. Thanks so much, Crystal. I am uh, watching the chat and looking at all of the great community resources. So thank you so much, everyone. I'm going to take the next few slides and talk about supportive services for aging clients. So a key question to ask within your organization is, how are we maximizing our case management activities to support our aging clients? This is really where you can continue to utilize some of the ways you engage with clients during the pandemic and also think outside of the box. So as you all are sharing with your peers, there are a number of community resources out there and Crystal highlighted several in the previous slides as well. Exploring with and connecting clients to those community resources can really expand the current case management activities that your organization offers. And I know in the chat, I saw that Yes, uh, AARP is a paid membership, but there are a number of other free resources out there 
we're just kind of trying to throw out a number of different resources for you to explore with your clients to see what is a good fit. Also working with the client to really consider creating social or physical activity plans that can really help clients get out of the house, create or maintain social connections, and stay active. Of course, um, this should be done in consultation with your client's medical provider if you're thinking about physical activity plans, given that clients have different levels of ability for physical activity. But again, this is the type of plan that you can really work on together to help get a client out and about in the community to the level that they feel comfortable. And although it may not work for every client, considering alternative ways of staying in touch, including text messages or Zoom meetings um, on those off weeks that you're not meeting with somebody in your office. Working with community partners, of course, to really expand social programming that can support aging clients. And I want to point out that someone in the chat is a community provider and wanted to find out how to connect with their local HOPLA provider. So that's going to be something we can talk about at the end of today's session. Also, really keeping an eye out for signs of mental health decline. So people who are now missing meetings, uh, depressive tendencies, forgetfulness, beyond what is typical for that person's age or condition, and really look at addressing that quickly with the client um, and likely with the medical provider as well. And I'm just gonna point out that um, a vast majority of folks in the United States live in rural or under-resourced areas. I live in the state of Alabama. Um, majority of the state here is rural. So typically in rural or lower resource communities, there are fewer options. And so you really need to get creative. Where do folks meet for morning coffee? Um, do they meet at Cracker Barrel or McDonald's? I used to work in uh, Tuscaloosa and a group of older gentlemen met at 5 a.m. every morning at the Northport Diner. Um, and that's where they connected with one another. And that was their social support group. So you know, it's really a thought about how do we connect with the folks in our community? How do we get um, to create social activities and engagements? And I'll just point out if we can put it in the chat that there was a great article in the New York Times a few weeks ago about uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and that there is a group that meets to dance uh, regularly and everybody is over 65. So that's just something where uh, they found a different way to connect with one another and that's really exciting. Crystal, I see that you've come off mute. Did you wanna add something? Well, I just wanna, as, as people are looking to what might be non-traditional kind of partners like senior centers and others, um, and, and some other programs that are more focused strictly on aging and um, not HIV, I think that those partnerships can be beneficial both ways with cross-training across agencies that, that uh, many of those organizations don't have expertise in HIV or, or an understanding of what many of the uh, of the issues are that that people have um, and what is causing their sense of isolation or um, things like that. So I think offering to do sessions on um, on HIV and then of course getting them to provide more on um, on aging could lead to some really robust new partnerships. Thanks, I really appreciate that. That's a great point. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit more about some other supportive services that we can offer our aging clients. We can talk about meal or grocery delivery. Um, I know since COVID, many communities have meal or grocery delivery. We have a couple here where I live, um, but in many places there are lots of options or even uh, some grocery stores are now doing delivery services. So there are a lot of great opportunities out there. There are also Meals on Wheels or other programs like this, some feeding programs, and there are likely community members who would be happy to support this type of activity. We're gonna talk about volunteerism a little bit later, but that's another place where that could happen. Peer support and friendship is so important 
um, for all of us, and especially as we age. And friends and peers can really help with a number of different activities like shopping, um, going together, meal prep, doing that together, and really thinking about other needs such as running to the pharmacy to pick up meds or taking to and from medical or other appointments. There's just a lot of ways that people can think about incorporating peer support in that space. And we're going to hear a lot about peer support um, later on in today's conversation. And of course, there are a number of uh, drop-in centers or daycare centers that provide a variety of, of activities, including meals, sometimes laundry. There is a place here in a very rural part of our state called Project Horseshoe Farm. They offer midday meals and a place for people to gather. Um, and that's a really great opportunity for older adults in the community. I want to point out here, of course, that um, transportation is eligible, but of course, that is in this case really limited to therapeutic circumstances. Um, and we can talk about that a little bit later if you have specific questions, but more guidance will be forthcoming on that. Um, I'd love for people to put in the chat if there are other uh, supportive services that you have been offering. And um, I believe we are going to put the Menti link in the chat. Uh, and that way you can put your ideas and activities that you have implemented or have in your community in the Menti, and then we can make that available after this presentation. So Liz just put the Menti link. You have to go, um, if, the, if the direct link doesn't work for you, there's a code right there, and that way we can put all of this together. And I'm thinking, Ari, you might be showing the mentee site. Great. Thank you so much. All right. So we see food and peer support. I'm sure there will be a lot of other things that go into the mentee after or as we continue our conversation. And um Ari, when you have a moment, if we can go back to the presentation, that would be great. And so that mentee will keep going for the entirety of our conversation. So please um, add things to that. Will you go to the next slide, please? So um, I started to talk about this on the previous slide um, and both Crystal and I have really touched on the importance of peer support throughout our lives but it can really take on a deeper meaning when you and your peers have faced stigma and discrimination, which is unfortunately the case for many individuals who are living with HIV. Our, uh, our speaker and colleague, Joe Robinson, is gonna talk more in depth about the Silver Lining Project in Atlanta, which really uh, upholds mm -hmm. peer support in just a few minutes. But I do wanna to touch on a couple of considerations if you're planning to implement a peer support program in your own organization. Long-term survivors have a different set of needs than those who are newly diagnosed. And there are ways to pair individuals together, including connecting newly diagnosed individuals with those who are uh, long-term survivors to really help uh, sort of navigate the initial uh, days, weeks, and months of a new diagnosis. But you'll really wanna consider whether you wanna have different cohorts for different age groups uh, and other, you know, things like time living with the virus. But this, of course, is a prime opportunity to talk with your clients, to ask what they need and want in their lives. Um, next slide, please. All right. So we've talked a lot about this uh, around an active lifestyle, but I also just want to give an example. So Crystal did an example of doing that elder care search I also use the elder care link as it related to just an active lifestyle and taking a deep dive. So I used Missoula, Montana, and I found a few different options, right? One, uh, there are a number of volunteer opportunities, and we know volunteerism has multiple benefits, of course, contributing to a community need, but also people who volunteer get to get out and meet people and be active in the community. So uh, there are a ton of volunteer opportunities in the Missoula, Montana area. I also saw that the Museum of Art hosts Art in the Moment, 
which is a monthly program that promotes connection and companionship for individuals who are living with early stage memory loss and their care partners through art. So that is something that's free of charge and a great opportunity. And I bet if you have an art museum or even um, an art community in your, uh, in your particular area, you can find something like this. They also host uh, memory loss conversations, which is of course no cost, but a, a way to navigate what it's like to have memory loss. And then I looked for uh, free exercise classes. And so I found that the YMCA has classes tailored to adults. There are free yoga exercise uh, classes in the park and at the public library. So really all it takes uh, if you for you as a case manager is really to spend a few minutes on Google or your other search engine and try to find great opportunities in every community. I'll also just point out a couple of other thoughts around, are there community gardens? Are there book clubs? Do you wanna have game night at your organization? What about an Oscar watch party? Really, there are so many different ways that you can connect with folks and it's just about us connecting the dots. So I'm gonna take a moment now to turn it back over to Crystal to discuss another way to connect folks um, in addition to the supportive services we just talked about in the connections to community resources. Okay, Crystal, it's back to you. Great, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. So we wanted to finish this part of the presentation by um, talking a little bit about um, shared housing. As most of you know, COPPA allows the use of shared housing, which can be of assistance in housing HAPA eligible households, especially in tight, expensive housing markets, which is pretty much everywhere um, these days. The HAPA rules require that any shared housing situation must be voluntary. In other words, it cannot be required by a housing provider, but rather offered as a voluntary option. Uh, in many cases, clients have already set up shared housing arrangements with other individuals and programs allow them to remain in that shared unit when providing um, uh, prorated rental assistance. And we bring this up now um, as one option that could be used when considering how to house HAPA eligible clients who are aging. Shared housing can be utilized with tenant-based rental assistance or in project-based units, again, on a voluntary option uh, for clients. Like any housing model, this one has pros and cons for tenants at any age. For some clients, a shared housing option may really help combat social isolation, but for others, sharing space might not be really what they want. And this serves as a reminder of how important it is to listen closely to client preferences and past experiences to guide their housing plan. In, in this case, as in many, one size does not fit all. And I know that there were um, you know, some references in the comments to some of this being just very theoretical and not real specific about what programs should do. Um, but I, I, it's really designed to uh, encourage people to start thinking about the, the emerging needs of this aging HIV population and also combining that concern with real on the ground inf local information based on local needs assessments about um, what, you know, what, what is most needed um, in your community. The, um, so it's, it really comes down to, um, you know, being part of revisiting what your system of care is and including this, if appropriate, as a, a priority and beginning to look at what could be covered under your HAPA grants and what could be, what could benefit from additional partnerships um, with others in the community. Um, next slide, please, Ari. Right. 
And these are just um, some of the, um, the activities um, that can be used. Um, as we've already mentioned, resource ID is something that can help fund a community-wide needs assessment um, or be used for partner development, including you know, referral systems and all of those kinds of things. And I will say just on the, on the needs assessment, there are many other um, options that are labor intensive and, or as expensive, um, which would include uh, client focus groups and discussion groups. Those are things that can be done very easily and um, can produce some very rich information from the people that you're serving about what works and what doesn't. Um, it's, uh, you know, and that's something that could be done by staff. It could be done by um, university students. It could be done by other volunteers. Um, and I, I know that there are uh, grantees out there that have used this fairly extensively to augment their more um, uh, their hard data on what the needs are. Um, and of course, um, project or tenant-based rental assistance. Um, either individual or shared housing is an important component of this, um, as well as the, the support services that Ashley was talking about, um, which supportive services under HAPA has always been a very flexible menu of activities. And um, so keep in mind that, that this is an area where people could be uh, creative. Um, doing daycare and drop-in centers um, and uh, things that that just start to, to um, bring people together and um, pro provide some support using peer support, even on a very limited basis at first and then expanding it. Um, and you know all of the other things that are, are listed under supportive services. Uh, next, please. We're very happy uh, to welcome a, um, a guest today. I'd like to introduce Joe Robinson, who's with the Silver Lining Project uh, in Atlanta. Joe, thank you so much for joining us today. We would, I know that our audience would like to hear more about you, um, your background, and particularly the, the program that you run in Atlanta. So yes, Crystal, one, um, thank you for the introduction. Um, um, my name is Joe Robinson, and um, just to give you brief information about myself, I'm a native of New York. Um, I lived in Oakland, Tampa, and now residing in Atlanta, Georgia. And so my background is pretty fluid. I've spent 20 years in financial services, 15 years as a travel consultant, and do 20 years volunteering, advocating, and working within the HIV area. So over the past 20 years, I've served in various committees and groups as it relates to HIV, in addition to attending the Black AIDS Institute. I served as the chairperson of the Sacramento HIV Planning Council, and I was the co-chair of NIH Adult Clinical Trials Community Constituency Group. I'm currently a member of the American Academy of HIV Medicine's Community Advisor Group and the Atlanta EMA Planning Council. But my greatest accomplishment right now is working for Thrive, located in Atlanta, where I'm the lead program coordinator of the Silver Lining Project. So first, I just want to thank Ashley and Crystal for extending this opportunity to the Silver Lining Group to talk about our program. Um, the It's focused on supporting adults and combating social isolation and loneliness is pretty key to what we do. So you go to the next slide. So brief history, some people have heard about Thrive, but let me just share some of the information. Um, Thrive is an actual acronym. It stands for Transforming HIV Resentment into Victories Everlasting, SS is for Support Services. And so we are located in Atlanta, Georgia. 
Um, it was founded by three individuals, Daniel Griffin, Dwayne Bridges, and our current executive director, Larry Walker. So the organization was established in May, on May 4th, 2015, which we have an anniversary coming up. And we're a 501c3 organization that's to provide support for Black same gender loving men living within Atlanta. <clears throat> and we're looking, we look to serve and build a community platform. We also look to share pertinent information and we try to find ways to improve health equity. Hey, Joe. Yes. So sorry to interrupt. Could you, we're having a little bit of difficulty in hearing you. Um, just so the audience knows, closed captions have been enabled. So you can put your closed captioning on. Um, and maybe Ari, you can speak to how you do that. But Joe, is there a way you might be able to get a little closer to your microphone? Is this better? I think so. I'm going to look at people in the, I'm going to look to the chat because we've got a very active chat. Um, so if you can hear Joe better um, now that he's closer, please let us know. All right, Ari, can you just show people how to do the chat, uh, the closed caption, please? Yeah, um, so uh, on your toolbar, which is where you have your, um, like your chat, Q&A, all of that, there should be, it'll either be um, its own button that says closed captions, and you can click into that to enable. Um, if you don't see it right away, there may, there may be um, on that toolbar uh, three dots that say more. If you click that um, that more area, you'll get a drop down menu, and you should be able to um, access your captions that way. Um, uh, if you do have any other questions um, as, as as far as sort of technical functions of Zoom, please do put them in the chat, and I will be there to help you. Great, and I have just uh, I went to more with my with the three dots, and I put the the live captions on and I can now see everything. So Joe, would you please go ahead? Sorry for the interruption. There's no problem. Um, sorry that individuals missed some of the information. So we'll talk about the Silver Lining Project, which was formed through a grant from Gilead and it was um, done in 2019 to create and maintain a safe space, both virtual and physical, where mature African-American men living with HIV can share, discuss, and advocate for issues impacting our community. And so here you'll see, and um, you should see the image of the three co-founders, Claude Bowen, Nathan Townsend, and Malcolm Reed. And Malcolm is currently the program director at Thrive SS. You go on to the next slide. Can you go on one more? Thank you. So a component of the pro of the project is the Silver Skills Curriculum. And the Skills Curriculum is a five module intervention that allows participants to share their lived experiences. And so one of the modules talks about Stigma, which speaks directly to this particular webinar, where we allow conversations to address and how to discuss how do we combat social isolation and loneliness. And so we offer the opportunity of combat, combat, combating this, excuse me, by establishing memories, which are the images that you see on the wall. So some of these images are taken indoor at Thrive, and other images are captured outdoor and public places. <clears throat> Excuse me, so on the next several um, slides that we're going to show you, I'm going to take you on a journey on how we look at how we combat isolation. So here, the group of us ventured on a weekend trip to Carowinds Amusement Park, which is located in right outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. And on this particular day, we were the first group to arrive online at the park. And except for one person here, everyone 
down on this roller coaster called Fury 325, which we found out later was the tallest and fastest giga roller coaster. And so I'm in the middle there in yellow, but the gentleman to the right, I need to highlight because he's the eldest member in the group. And he had originally said that he was not going to ride on a roller coaster. He's never did it and he never would. But suffice, suffice to say that he, along with the rest of the group, rode twice on the roller coaster. So it, we, I share this to kind of give an idea or give an example of how sometimes we may have an idea of what we don't want to do, but when you're around other vigils, they can tend to give you a different vision on what can happen. We go to the next slide. So in this slide here, while it wasn't our first photo shoot, this campaign caught the attention of many people in the HIV field. So the topic was a presentation that was done at the, at the USCHA, both in Washington, D.C. and Puerto Rico. And we used the coin on words, I thrive because I swallow. Because at one point, one day we were sitting around, we were talking, and we were talking about how as African-American men, we continually thrive and we actually started to hold pills up to our mouths. And we made this comment of saying, well, we're actually thriving because we're swallowing pills. And so while some people thought it was a great play on words, we looked at it as an opportunity to, one, we're doing our part in being long-term survivors. We're doing our part in maintaining adherence and we're doing a part at showing that this is a community that some people thought didn't exist and we're still around. You go to the next picture, next slide, excuse me. So fast forward at that point, we, like the rest of the world, we were stuck in COVID. And so this particular photo here was taken once we were able to begin ice um, to social and not have to stand six feet away from each other. And so this was taken at Piedmont Park and it's labeled swag, surviving while aging gracefully, because we thought it was important for us to give ourselves permission that we actually survive yet another pandemic. We go to the next slide. So this, on this particular photo shoot, we had several things going on, but we were lucky where several pharmaceuticals actually had given us t-shirts and we said, well, we'll do this photo shoot to show that one, you know, we have a organization and we're not like limited to just who actually supports us. And we always find that if you give us a photo shoot opportunity, we're going to take advantage of it. But it still talks to how do we minimize social isolation? Because we encourage people to come out and join us. You go to the next slide. So when we're discussing black men showing up in spaces, this is one of the many opportunities where we gather and create memories. So early in 2023, there was a play that um, came to Atlanta called Hot Wing Kings. And this was uh, actual, um, was directed by Victoria Hall, who's known for producing P-Valley or the Broadway play Tina the Tina musical. And so here we're looking at, um, we can actually come to spaces and it's not isolated. So <clears throat> in the park, it's pretty open, but here we were in a space where we're enjoying the company of others and actually enjoying this play. You go on to the next slide. So moving forward, we're talking about pearls of wisdom. And so the Silver Lining Project team started to look at different ways on how 
we can show up in spaces and pretty much elevate how we're going to approach who we are. You can go to the next slide. So the Pearls of Wisdom was inspired by one of our staff, many staff members, Kenny Okafor, and he had stated, Pearls of Wisdom is an opportunity to destigmatize what is considered beauty for Black men. Pearls are a sign of elegance that has been historically reserved for women. Black men of all orientations deserve a space to feel elegant. So we go to the next slide. So this one, we, we, we stepped out of the box for a moment. And typically, or in the past, many of the photo shoots have included just the men who were over 50. And Thrive has a community that consists of individuals of all walks, shapes, form, and fashion. And many people, many of the members, many others who've come by have said, you know, we want to be part of these memories that you're actually creating throughout the years. So this is our first photo shoot where the men over 50 are joined by men who are under 50. <clears throat> and so the our star here is in the bottom right hand corner where this is the son of one of our staff members and we think that one of the most powerful things that took place was in the room he kept looking at everyone and he saw these pearls around their neck and he kept looking and touching his pearls and so we thought that was very powerful because we feel that there's a message that can be shared collectively when the group comes together. So if you go to the next slide, we understand pearls of wisdom is not a unilateral concept. We recognize the intersectionality of black men and understand wisdom is a bilateral process. Each person learns from each other and collectively we gain a better understanding. So in this picture here, we have one of the co-founders, Claude. The um, actual inspiration for the Pearls of Wisdom, Kenny, and the latter part there, our little person, Aiden, where we feel that, you know, one can think that wisdom should always flow from top to bottom, but we actually came into a room and we saw where wisdom flows top to bottom and bottom to top. And then the next slide. So once again, I wanna thank the group who put the webinar together for extending an invitation to the Silver Lining Project to talk about how our organization and our project looks at a way to minimize social isolation. And so here we have the staff of the Silver Lining Project. And from left to right, we have Chauncey, Daryl, and myself. So I've provided our email addresses. If anyone has any questions, it's all with our first name at thrivess.org. And that concludes my presentation. And I'll be happy to answer any questions that may appear. Um, sorry, Joe. I was just in awe of all the photos and little Aiden, who is just adorable. Um, yeah. Okay, we've got Joe, y'all. If you have a question, please uh, put it in the chat. Um, excuse me, in the Q and A. That's why we're using Q and A, and we can ask those questions. Okay, uh, here is a great question, Joe, and um, perhaps we can have you answer it. How can folks replicate 
a uh, silver lining project in their own community? Um, how do you fund it? And are there uh, multiple funding sources? All good questions. The first one I'm going to um, say that <clears throat> about the how do you replicate this? I would just say one, reach out to uh, Malcolm Reed because he's the director of programs. He can answer that question on how this can be replicated. Um, the and it's Malcolm at ThriveSS.org is his email address. He'll be more than glad to answer that question for you. We currently are funded by one source, um, but that doesn't, you know, I think that we've started to see opportunities appear where, so I'm leveraged information on how we do different things. Um, but I think that the funding kind of addresses where you're looking at the resources from your local community. Um, but that's also another thing where I think that Malcolm can give more specific information because we love, they know I'm creative and Malcolm is the answer to all of the creativity that we kind of throw out there for. I love that. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, let's, Asha, Please. there was another question of just, um, I think more just, just curious, like how you brought, you know, that group of folks into the group initially, or how, how do people, how are people able to know about the group and, um, access it? Oh, so that's a good question. Um, so the Thrive has its own private Facebook group and generally we work from that community perspective with they some may hear of a Judy system. So your friends tell a friend and the friend tells a friend and a friend tells a friend. And that's pretty, that's how the organization grew. Because you, you know, your, your peers, peers know what's going on. And when you're talking with your friends, if you're in a group of 10 people, the likelihood is there's conversation that takes place. And through that conversation, that's how people are introduced one way. Um, we've met and we started to grow more because we've actually done presentations outside of Atlanta. And it's interesting how when we go to talk, someone knows someone in another city and they'll say, well, you know, you mentioned something and I might have heard this information in, let's say, Birmingham, but I know of uh, this organization in Atlanta. You may want to go check them out. I want to say nine times out of 10, it's by a referral because someone knows someone. Okay, That's great. That's, oh, sorry, go ahead, Ashley. No, you and I were saying the same thing, which is thanks so much for that question. All right, Liz, should we go over some of the questions that have come in during the presentation? And maybe yeah, I our, think there's, our yeah, I think there's, to come online. Yeah, I think there's been a number of people. Please um, feel free to keep bringing, um, you know, putting your questions in the Q and A or in the chat. Um, I think one of the one of the earlier questions on, and it's uh, makes a lot of sense to 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 ask it. There's a number of folks here that are joining that are not. HOPWA grantees or project sponsors and um, might actually have expertise in, you know, areas of aging and want to get connected to HOPWA grantees and project sponsors. What's the best way to do that? The best way to get a hold of a HOPWA grantee or project sponsor would be to locate them on the HUD exchange. So I'm going to put a link on the HUD exchange on where you can locate your HOPWA grantee. Um, and then it's a really super easy um, search feature that will um, allow you to say exactly where you live and then allow you to drill down into, oh my, um, seeing what is, hang on a second, it came up as a very long web address that is not going to be helpful to you. Um, so I'm going to put this web address in here. 
And if you look at the right side of the page, it'll say contact a Hopwood grantee or program, and then you go through the steps and find out. You'll be able to drill down there on the grantee um, to see who they fund. So that's one way that you can um, look at who's getting Hopwa in your community and see what services they provide. Great, thanks, Kate. Mm -hmm. um, I think another on the other side of that, um, there I think there's a number of folks um, in the chat I think that are talking about, you know, resources being limited or not necessarily, um, you know, some Hopwa grantees or project sponsors might not be where they need, you know, are not necessarily at the place where. Um, they can deliver the type of services that we're talking about. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why we're having this series. But what would your advice be to try to make sure, um, you know, how folks can, you know, share thoughts or um, get grantees and project sponsors um, to be considering um, these needs more? Well, I think the simplest way to do that is to participate in your uh, HOPA program's annual action planning process. Um, every year, as a part of Formula Grantees' way of accessing HOPA formula funds, they have to uh, put out a uh, call for public, um, can, sorry, citizen participation. And depending on your community, that's going to look differently. So they should be put a notification out in the paper or it should be on their HOPA website to say what their annual action plan is. They should post a um, a, a, a draft of that out there and then say when they're going to be having, how they're going to be collecting community feedback. In some cases, it's a Zoom meeting. In some cases, it's a public meeting. In some cases, it's um, uh, they want written feedback. And you can say, these are the things I'm seeing in my community. These are the things that I think HOPWA should be paying for in our community to meet those needs. And the good news is that HOPWA is... Um, uh, has to be help with grantee in each community has to respond to each of those um, communications that come in. So if you go to a community, um, if you go to a community meeting, you go to a hearing, and you give public testimony or you submit in writing, they have to be responsive to that. And so um, that's one way that you can get your thoughts across. Uh, Crystal, Ashley, any other thoughts on that? I think that um, covers it, but, but I wanted, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. No, I was just going to say there are a number of questions that have come up about, you know, with people asking whether there'll be more funding or funding specifically for, um, you know, some of the increased needs that um, are being seen among um, people aging with HIV. And I think it's probably early days to say whether there will be uh, special initiatives or waivers or anything like that. Um, would you be able to respond to that? I would not be able to respond to that. I would be able to say, though, that HOPWA has increased funding over the last five years, and we continue to see increases, and we hope to continue to see increases into the future, um, and that this is a terrific opportunity um, as we said earlier in the set review recharge period is to really take a look at what's happening in your community. Crystal, you refer to it yourself, which is the needs assessment. What, what is going on? And take a look at what programs are funded by your HOPWA program. Um, are you funding models that are outdated? Are you funding models that don't actually meet your need? Are you following your data about where those needs are in your community? So, um, Unfortunately, I don't have a magic wand to give everybody more money, which I wish I could, because I give all of you more money. Um, but uh, since I don't have that, um, I would just say, take a look at the resources that you have been given, um, because formula grantees get an award every year. That's good to, for three years. Um, take a look, see what's out there, see what, um, what you're funding, and whether or not you need to uh, move around some money. And outsource when you can, right? If there are community resources that provide oh, services yeah. to uh, older adults, then outsource uh, to the extent that you can. This is really where Crystal uh, talked a lot about partnerships mm -hmm. and you know, there's a lot of opportunity out there. The other thing I would just throw out is that every community has a continuum of care uh, related to people who are experiencing homelessness. And Hopple partners need to be at that table as well, but I know that there were a lot of comments in the chat around folks who are uh, extremely low income and do not have all of the 
uh, some of the affluence that was mentioned in uh, in the chat. So there are a number of existing networks that already exist in your community and how do you tap into those and really maximize what you as the HOPWA grantee or project sponsor can do and then how can you partner with your community, um, the community partners and community resources. And thanks, Ashley. I wish as you were talking, I was just thinking that um, Ryan White is actually a really great resource. Um, and hopefully your couple person is sitting at your Ryan White table and they're doing some really good joint planning. But the Ryan White in many communities may fund uh, psychosocial support, which could be a really great opportunity for folks to get together and to be able to do some of these activities that prevent social isolation and loneliness. You know, someone also put in the chat earlier that I think was a really good point um, for the area, the, the local areas on, on aging. Um, they may not uh, necessarily be the expert in some areas, but, um, you know, they may not have a, the robust services, but they would actually know who in the area does. Mm -hmm. So they're a really helpful resource just for even navigating what resources are out there, even if they don't provide that specific thing themselves. And I recognize that every community is different, but there are a number of faith communities out there that are already providing uh, different types of services and maybe uh, an opportunity to think about partnership too. Again, not necessarily for everybody, but there are, um, there are some very philanthropic faith communities out there uh, that are engaged in services for people who are um, under-resourced in their communities. And I think another thing to keep in mind um, that we haven't talked about a lot here is how you conduct outreach, especially to this older population. Um, <clears throat> because, you know, people, there are certainly um, elderly HIV positive people out there who, um, you know, who on their own will go looking for solutions and opportunities and so forth. But there are also people who, uh, and especially uh, with the pandemic and how isolated everyone has been, have kind of gone to ground and are not really, um, are not being reached. Um, so <clears throat> revisiting outreach methods. And um, I mean, Ashley, you mentioned um, those, uh, you know, harder to serve areas or harder to reach people in, the rural, um, rural areas, but I also think that there are some people who just are very, uh, keeping very much to themselves, to their apartments, to wherever they are, and, and don't know what else is out there that could help them. Um, there is a question about needs assessment, and we and we touched on that briefly. Um, so the question is, it looks about 50% of those on the session have conducted a needs assessment. Are there resources where those questions can be found that we could emulate? I appreciate seeing some possible questions posed here earlier. That's a great question. Um, <laughs> I, I would like to hear about some of those communities that have conducted a needs assessment about HIV as well. So if you are one of those communities, please um, put your um, uh, name in the chat and let us know that you are one of those communities that has done that. And we can explore that further um, and possibly bring them back to talk about how they did it for another webinar or, or maybe in office hours. Um, Kate, there's a question that just came in about HOPWA eligible costs. Um, sure. So as uh, people with HIV age, some end up in long-term facilities or assisted living facilities. R Ryan White Part B does not cover these expenses. Can HOPWA cover these? Uh, HOPWA can sometimes be used to cover medical, but it has to be the payer of last resort in that case. And there has to be documentation and they have to get permission from their HUD field office in order to do that. There are other more appropriate resources um, like 
Medicaid or Medicare um, to be able to provide those, uh, or there might be some state funded things. Um, so I would hesitate to say yes, go ahead and do that because it's really not something that is encouraged because how, how what is supposed to be for housing. Um, and it does, like I said, take a uh, permission. You need to get permission from your field office in order to do that. And you have to prove that there's no other resources available. That's another area in which uh, the area agencies on aging could be very helpful okay. in um, parsing out what uh, the eligibility requirements would be for assisted living or other nursing care or in-home care, different kinds of things that may be covered by Medicare or Medicaid. Um, you know, it's it's a whole, um, you know, they're really experts in that. And so, things that can't easily or readily be covered by HAPA definitely may be able to be covered through more uh, traditional elder um, kinds of systems. Um, Ashley, do you see any other questions there? I haven't got to yet? No, I've been watching um, and I haven't. But it sounds like there are um, always going to be needs in our community to talk about uh, resources and, uh, you know, increasing resources and budgets to be able to serve everybody who is in need. Um, so those are some of the ongoing that's the ongoing theme of some things in the chat and along the Q&A too. And that was not meant to be an insulting comment. Well, and I think it would be helpful for us to try to seek out some more specific information about um, people who need uh, in-home care or assisted living and what um, what the regulations or other things may allow because um, you know most people seem to enter assisted living as private pay um, you know before um, Medicare or Medicaid can take over but it's that's not going to be possible for most of our client population. So it's just where where is the line on you know medical versus um, housing and care and supportive services? Sorry, that wasn't an answer. It was just another question. And out there is, as, as um, you know, this is a work in progress, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the first time that this program has really started talking about this. And I, for one, am actually really excited about that. Um, I am thrilled that we are talking about people with HIV who are aging, because that means we're finally getting to a place in our society that we were, you know, we, we have meds that work and people are living and it's really exciting. Um, so I don't get mad at me for saying that. Um, but anyway, I think it's great. And so there are some, there are lots of things that I think that we're all starting to, you know, try and go into new directions that we hadn't been going into before. And so um, absolutely, Crystal, having um, uh, resources, pointing out resources or bringing somebody on to talk about resources that are available um, is a terrific one. And again, those area agencies on aging also might be able to do that uh, in the interim, fill that void for you. I think there is a question just about how you can uh, work on getting updated guidelines for your HOPWA policies and procedures. And that's really a local uh, conversation to have. Um, obviously we can provide some guidance, but that would be something that you would talk to your local um, grantee about. I don't know, Kate or Crystal, if you wanna add anything to, to my response to that question. Um, I actually, 
felt like I needed more information from that person to find out exactly what kind of um, uh, guidelines they're referring to. So if they wanted to put more information in the Q&A to really express what guidelines they're looking for, um, I had better be able, be able to better answer their question. Thanks. Um, Kate, I think they are talking about the hop like their hop up program policies and guidelines that the state has put together the state grantee oh well then they would definitely need to reach out directly to their state grantee to um see what resources they have available because HOPWA regulations are promulgated by the um, Office of HIV AIDS Housing and then um, those are the minimums that folks have to meet, but they can also set some things that are more stringent at the local level so they can um, do things like um, um, set different income levels that can't be above 80% of area median income, but they can look lower and target those resources uh, better or differently. And again, that information has to be put into the annual action plan that goes out for public comment. Oh, I have a response to Chelsea. I'm going to put it in the chat. Chelsea, I'm going to write you right now. Terrific. So I think that we are at the end of the webinar. And again, this information will be available uh, on the link that we put in the chat earlier today. I don't know if anyone has any final thoughts that they want to share with the group, but I want to give a special, special thank you to Joe Robinson and the Silver Lining Project. Um, and just uh, to put a smile on my face with all of those gorgeous photos that we got to see of the men today. That was pretty tremendous. So, um, and y'all have the email addresses if you want to reach out to Joe for additional information. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us and hope you have a great rest of your week.